Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the shop. In the last few videos, we are getting our shop ready. Uh, hopefully, you're getting your shop ready. Uh, we built some sawhorses. We have a bench-like object here to work on. Now, <laughs> in a perfect world, uh, you know, I would I would just start building out the entire shop with the tools that we've introduced, and we could do that. Um, but it would cost several hundred dollars in construction lumber and plywood to do so. And in reality, you know, building a shop is a process. It's going to take a long time. And that doesn't mean that there isn't things that we can't do in the meantime. Uh, we need to start talking about getting more tools into the shop and how to go about getting the best deals, how to refurbish old tools, uh, flea market finds, eBay, stuff like that. And whether you're going to make an all power tool shop or you know you want to get into the hand tools, there are certain things that you're going to need either way because sometimes hand tools are just a better choice. Power tools take a lot of setup, a lot of uh, testing to make sure you get the cut right Whereas hand tools, if you're making one cut, you just pick up a handsaw and go to work. So we're going to start off with handsaws. So I'm going to show you a variety of handsaws that I have and talk about the differences between them. And then we're going to get into restoring an old handsaw that we got from a tag sale. All right, now there's no reason to be intimidated. Um, you do not need to get all your handsaws all at once. Um, the first couple of saws that you're probably going to end up getting uh, is a cross-cut panel saw and a cross-cut miter saw. These two are probably the most common saws ever made. And you can find these at flea markets. Guys have entire boxes of these that they're selling for a buck a piece. Um, you know, most of them are in pretty bad disrepair, so we're going to get into restoring one of these, but those are one of the easier ones to find. This is a rip cut panel saw, and we'll talk about tooth geometry later on, but you can see the teeth are quite large in this. This is for cutting down the length of boards rather than across the grain. Um, the knife, the Teeth in here are filed almost like chisels. This is another rip cut panel saw that uh, I made for smaller work. Then we have our back saws. They're called back saws because they have this stiffening back to them. Uh, again, your miter saw. It's got fairly fine teeth for uh, slicing through the grain crosswise. This is a smaller tenon saw. Um, filed rip cut for cutting down the cheeks of your tenons. And then we move on to one of the smaller hand saws, back saws, is a dovetail. Um, you notice this one does not have the western pistol grip style handle. This is called a gentleman's handle. And it's made this way because when you're doing dovetails, you don't want to have a really hard, you're not trying to power it through the wood. You want the weight of the saw and the sharpness of the teeth to do most of the work. So you want a very relaxed grip. Um, the gentleman's saw style handle, you know, prevents you from, from over gripping it hard and, you know, just allowing it to cut through on its own. Uh, we're definitely going to be making a dovetail saw down the road because even though this is this is really all the handle you need for a dovetail I, I really do prefer the western grip um, pistol grip style um, something more like this without the uh, end but you can find these relatively cheaply um, woodcraft stores wood hobby stores you can find them for uh, about 20 bucks it's not a bad but Go on, go on eBay and try to find a dovetail saw with a pistol grip and you will see some outrageous prices, which is why we're going to be making our own. Next we get into some of the more specialty saws. Um, this is just a cheap one that I bought. This is a uh, coping saw. 
Uh, for small work, it's okay, but uh, the end here is fixed, so it doesn't turn as easily. For doing a lot of curved work, what you really want is a turning saw. And these are almost impossible to find in tag sales or flea markets. So, you know, we're going to end up making another one of these, but the blade twists all the way 360 degrees through the frame of the saw. So no matter where you are cutting, you can always move this back frame out of your way. Really nice for cutting a lot of curves or doing some intricate scroll work. Now there are tons of other kinds of saws out there and if you intend to have a full hand tool workshop then uh, you know you're going to be making or buying tons of saws. They, they come in all different tooth uh, numbers, teeth per inch uh, for all different purposes and lengths but this is just a really basic set that I have. Uh, I do intend to make more just because uh, I like I like making them. It's quite uh, it's a lot of fun. But we're going to get into making them. We're also going to get into sharpening them. Now, if you if that intimidates you or you don't like sharpening necessarily, then uh, there's plenty of options to send these out for uh, sharpening to professional services. We'll talk about how, the, how to sharpen rip and how to sharpen crosscut in another video. We'll do an entire video on saw sharpening. But for today, we're gonna deal with just restoring an old saw. And uh, I've already removed the saw nuts from this one, but this is pretty typical of what you're going to see in tag sales and flea markets and eBay. Uh, fairly rusty. Um, not very sharp at all. And uh, this handle is actually not too bad, but sometimes it'll have the horns broken off. Uh, somebody will have drilled through the back end here to, you know, hang a string it from it. But uh, yeah, um, I started cleaning this one up on this side just to get a look at it. And that was a couple days ago. The rust has already started to uh, redevelop. So yeah, that's, that's just how fast it happens and we need to get some protection on here to prevent the rust in the future. But let's get into cleaning this baby off. So we have our saw and again, this is a cross cut panel saw. Um, however, regardless of what kind of saw you end up getting, uh, it's going to be basically the same. Uh, we've removed the saw nuts. I'm gonna take off the saw handle, the tote, and I'm going to put the nuts and the handle somewhere safe. Um, be sure you don't lose these. These are quite difficult to find, so save them whenever you can. Now this is going to create quite a mess. You can see I've already done quite a bit over here. And uh, you don't want to do this anywhere where you plan to do a lot of woodworking because um, you're just going to end up messing up your bench. or you want to put down some kind of like sacrificial top. Uh, this whole bench is sacrificial at the moment, so it doesn't really matter. But we're going to clean up just the plate for now. We'll start by clamping that down. And we're going to start off just by hitting it with some, some wire brushes. If you have a wire wheel on a grinder, you can, uh, you can try. You can use it. Um, just don't try to try not to get too heavy into the plate. Um, one thing, you, you do want to have a dust mask or some kind of uh, <clears throat> respirator filtering out because this makes uh, a lot of dust and uh, I wouldn't recommend breathing in a whole lot of rust. So we're just going to go ahead and start scrubbing away the rusty spots on here and get a look at a cleaner plate to make sure that it doesn't have any serious pitting. All right, so we've scraped away any of the major scale. Um, honestly, this one, this side wasn't the worst. The other side was worse, um, and I already did that before. Um, if there's any major p 
hitting uh, that's going on, then the saw was probably no good. Uh, it, it damages the integrity, uh, stiffness of the metal. Uh, the other thing you want to check is you want to look at each tooth very carefully and make sure that there's no teeth missing and that there's no cracks in the plate itself. If there's a crack or there's teeth missing, then uh, you know you want to pass it by because <clears throat> cracked plates are, are going to end up breaking on you and missing teeth are, are just a pain to file the entire thing down and restore the teeth to the saw. But this one is in pretty good condition. Now what we're going to do is we're going to hit it with some sandpaper to bring it down to bare metal, get rid of all the rust spots that we can, and uh, kind of clean it up. Now there's some paint pieces here that will come off. Um, this is, the uh, panel saws are mostly for rough work. If you're going for uh, back saws, tenon saws, uh, miter saws, you're going to want to clean these plates up a bit more, make them a bit shinier. Uh, when we get into proper cutting technique, uh, we will discuss why a nice shiny plate with a mirror finish uh, is going to work better for you than a dull plate. Alright, so I have a bunch of different grits here. Looks like I have, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe 800. This is uh, 120. This feels like a 80, probably. Uh, we want to start off with at least an 80 or a 60 grit um, to really get the metal down. And I just have a block of wood here that's going to help me put some pressure onto it. Try to stay off the teeth as much as possible. We don't want to uh, sand those down too much. Um, you're going to end up removing a lot of the set in the saw. So, you know, try to, try to sand right up to them without sanding on top of them too much. All right, so now we have removed most of the rust <clears throat> from the plate. And what you see left here, the, the dark spots and the blackness, is what's known as patina. Uh, it's what metal develops over time. I actually like to leave a little bit of it on there. You can continue sanding this down to bare shiny metal if you like. I think it adds some, kind, some beauty to it and uh, lets you know that the tool was really old. So I like to leave a little bit of the patina on there, um, but we're still going to shine this up a little bit. Uh, we're going to move on through the grits. We just did 80, I'm gonna move up to the 120 here and start taking out some of the scratches. So as we're sanding it, I don't know if you can see this, but there is a maker's mark uh, printed into the saw plate. I can make out that it says Henry Diston here. Uh, Disson was a very common saw. You'll find hundreds of them out there. Uh, as we clean it up, some of the other words may come more into focus and uh, we might be able to see what number or model this used to be. All right, so we did the 120. I wish I had something more middle of the road, but unfortunately all I have is uh, 400. I have a lot of 400 though, so I guess if it takes us a little longer, that's okay. And as we're sanding out the scratches, uh, it's going to become more important to make long strokes rather than short scrubbing motions with the sandpaper. Um, the long strokes are going to be easier to get out and less, um, less obvious to the eye when you're looking at it and talking about getting a, a shine on the plate. All right, so I have sanded this saw all the way up to uh, 1200 grit. <laughs> you, you're going to find when working with metal that metal requires a much higher grit to become shiny than uh, wood does. And 
you know, even at 1200 grit, you can see that we have this kind of uh, satin type sheen to the metal. And you can still see some scratching a little bit. You know, this being a panel saw, it's not all that important to make it shiny. We, we were unable to bring out any more detail in the lettering. However, uh, it did uncover, I don't know if I can catch the light right here. Um, you can see there is a, a an eight uh, stamped into the back of this plate. And that actually refers to the teeth per inch of this saw, that's eight teeth per inch. And they go all the way from three and a half up to 20 or 30 teeth per inch, depending on the purpose. Dovetails have a, a much higher teeth per inch than uh, a rip cut saw would at three and a half, but this one is an eight teeth per inch. So we're gonna need to know that when we go to sharpen it. All right, so now that we have cleaned this saw plate, uh, we wanna make sure that it doesn't rust up again. And there's a variety of ways that you can do this. There's plenty of sprays out there that you can buy, uh, rust inhibitors. Um, you could use beeswax, you could use um, machine oil. Uh, I use machine oil quite often to give a temporary lubrication to saws and planes and we'll, we'll make up a uh, machine oil lubricating can soon. Uh, I don't have any machine oil on me at the moment, but uh, I use this for blacksmithing. This is just uh, some regular Brie wax, furniture wax, which works fine. Uh, you can heat this up with a hair dryer if you want to help uh, absorb it in. You can uh, rub it in with steel wool to help clean it up even more and uh, you know take out some more of the scratches. Or you can just use uh, regular old friction from a uh, rag. So we're gonna get a little bit on it, on our rag, and rub it in. All right, so we've cleaned off the rust. We've made it shinier than it used to be. And uh, we've rubbed in some furniture wax on both sides of the plate to give it a nice uh, durable finish that will keep the plate from rusting. Now, we're gonna put this aside for the moment and we're gonna do something with the saw tote. Now this one is actually not too bad. Um, aside from a bit of finish missing here, uh, it looks like the horns are not damaged and there's no holes drilled in it and this should be a, uh, a quick fix. Sometimes you'll find these where the handle is just broken to pieces, it's been abused, the horns are chewed up and you know, it's up to you whether you want to try and fix it or just make an entire new one. And you can find patterns for handles online in all kinds of places, but uh, my recommendation is uh, when you're first starting out, find, try to find one that's not too badly damaged and uh, just refinish it rather than try and build a whole new one. All right, so what we're going to do is we're just going to start by, it looks like they had some kind of lacquer or shellac or something on here. And we're just gonna start by sanding through it down to the clean wood. You can use sandpaper, uh, rasps, card scraper, you know, whatever you have. Depending on how old the saw is, you may wanna check this for lead. Um, a lot of finishes uh, way back, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's something you really want to get into. Checking if you do a lot of refinishing of antique furniture, uh, you can get lead checkers and all you need to do is create a little dust and then check it for lead. But uh, I'm going to wear a respirator just because I don't have any dust filtration around here. I don't want to breathe in, you know, lead or not. But let's, uh, let's get sanding. All right, so, you know, I was working on this with sandpaper and uh, while it was easy enough to get the finish off the flat spots, getting into the curves 
and the handle area here, uh, I just couldn't get enough pressure into it to really scrape it out. So I think what we're going to do is employ the help of a pipe clamp here to hold the work and we're going to use some files to try and get into the curves a little better and scrape out some more of that finish. Uh, I have a selection of files here. This is a rat tail rasp. Um, these are just a couple of Nicholson rasps and this is a handle makers rasp. This is a specialty one without it has no uh, teeth on one side and it has a curved profile to help you get into the edges and curves of handles. All right, so we have removed 90% of the finish here, except for areas like that where the saw nuts sit um, and, and some of the very uh, sharp corners here. We'll get in with some sandpaper. Now, at this point, we could simply take some sandpaper, go through the grits, smooth it out, throw some finish on it, and put it back together. However, um, a lot of times, at least in my opinion, on these production saws, uh, the handles are always kind of one size fits all, and it just doesn't work for my hand. It doesn't feel as comfortable. Um, so what I like to do is I like to change the profile back here a little bit, make it more comfortable. Um, I, I don't abuse my saws too badly, so I like to trim these horns down to, to a nicer edge, not so no, it's flat on the back. Um, I, they, they do this intentionally so that if you knock it or bump it, it is less likely to break off. But uh, I like to take it down just a, a little bit, make the, the, the horns here just a little bit sharper. Yeah, I'm going to flatten this out just a hair. You know, and this is my saw. It's, uh, I'm making it for my shop, and why not make it for my hand? <laughs> All right, so now I have trimmed it down. My hand is a bit smaller. Um, so, you know, I like a, a smaller handle, but I've trimmed it down to a point where it feels uh, pretty comfortable now. And uh, I'm just gonna go and smooth it out a little bit, uh, take out some of the rough edges, and uh, then we'll work on the horns here. Now when you're working on sanding, you wanna make sure you're sanding with the grain. Uh, the scratches are less noticeable if they go with the grain. All right, so now that we have sanded and sanded and sanded and sanded some more, uh, we should be ready to put a finish on here. Um, but before we do that, we're just gonna give it a little wipe down with uh, a damp rag. I got a little water here. Uh, doesn't need to be soaking, just a little bit of water. And the purpose is to simply remove any dust particles that may affect the finish and this will give us a good look at the what what is probably going to look like when it's finished so you can you can see any imperfections or areas that maybe you need to sand a little bit more right, so you can see just a little bit a little bit of dust in there a little bit of sawdust now we're going to be using boiled linseed oil which is typically not too picky a finish um you know, I mean, you just put it on there and let it soak for a minute, then wipe it off. Um, very simple finish to use. You could also use uh, tongue oil, Danish oil. Um, you could put on a poly, wipe on polys work great. Typically for uh, shop tools, 
I prefer to just, you know, simple is best. I'm not looking to build up a huge, uh, a thick coat. I don't need it to be durable. I can always reapply later on if the finish starts to fade or something. Now I'm gonna be using some painter's triangles to help keep this up off of the bench so that it dries well, just like that. Um, I've taken a little piece of rag, I cut it, because usually these rags are way too big for spreading finish. But we're just gonna take a little bit, soaked into the rag, and we're gonna wipe it on. This is not complicated. It doesn't need to be a thick layer. In fact, small, thinner, multiple thinner layers is better for finishing than having thick layers. All right, so once we've coated all the surfaces, we're just gonna let that sit for a few minutes and then we'll take a clean cloth and wipe it dry of all excess oil and leave it to dry. Uh, one important thing about finishes, uh, especially with boiled linseed oil, is it tends to get very hot when it dries and that can cause combustion if left, if you, you definitely don't want to wad this up and throw it into your garbage bin. You want to spread it out, uh, drape it over something to dry, and then once it's dry, you can throw it away. All right, so I've given it, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And uh, because this has already been finished once before, the wood fibers have soaked up finish from the previous, from the manufacturer when it was new. So you're not gonna get a huge amount of penetration, but we're just gonna take a clean rag and wipe off any excess finish that may be floating on the top. Typically, if this were a brand new piece that we were doing, uh, we would want to flood as much finish as it could handle in there and let it soak it up for you know 10 15 minutes then we'd allow it to dry for a day or two then we'd go back maybe give it a light sanding apply another top coat to it um, in, in this case you're skipping the first step and we're just applying the top coat here and after it's dry i will come back and Probably apply a little bit of furniture wax just to smooth it out, give it a nice feel. But you just want to dry it off until it has a nice, a nice sheen to the wood. It doesn't look damp anymore. All right, we're just gonna let that sit for a day or two until it's no longer oily or tacky or, or anything. Uh, and then we'll, we'll rub it with some wax and reassemble and we'll be all set. All right, so it has been 24 hours. Uh, so we're going to check it, and it feels dry to me. I got nothing coming off in my hands, doesn't feel sticky or tacky in any way. And at this point, like I said, you could choose to put on another coat if you wanted to, um, but this is just a shop tool, and I don't need to build up a heavy, thick coating. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to rub in a little bit of furniture wax and that will help fill some of the end grain pores a little bit, um, take out any, any roughness, um, and just make it really nice and smooth to the touch. And I think that looks really nice. I, I like that a whole lot better than the, uh, the glossy look that, uh, it had before with the, uh, I don't know, it, shellac or poly or not sure what they had on there originally all right so just like before <clears throat> i'm using a little brie wax um, furniture polish this is clear um, but i'm just i cut myself off a little little pad of cloth i'm going to get some wax on it and we're just going to rub it in all over 
All right, you don't want to leave like globs on there, but you do want to leave a little bit of a layer which is going to dry and become slightly cloudy. And then we're going to take a, a clean rag and just wipe it, buff it off. All right, we're just going to leave that to dry. This doesn't take nearly as long as uh, the finish. So give it maybe 15, 20 minutes and then we'll rub it off. All right, so we've given it some time. Now we're just gonna wipe off, rub it in. All right, so that's it. I mean, that the wax coating gives it a nice, soft, buttery feel. I, I like the way the handle fits. Now we just need to reassemble the plate and we'll be all set. All right, now I did clean up these buttons slightly. Um, just uh, just a little soap and water and a, a rag, little little tooth polish. Um, I wanted to maintain the, the antique look. You can shine them as much as you want, take them to a wire wheel or, or polish them until they're bright and silvery. But uh, I think it would have looked odd uh, on an old saw plate to have bright shiny buttons. There we go, that is our completed cross-cut saw refurbishment. Um, now, the plate does need to be sharpened, but that is a video for an entirely different day. Um, and you can find sharpening services for around $20. So, it really all depends. There, there is going to be significant I wouldn't say significant. There is going to be um, some expense involved in learning how to sharpen your own saws. And you may decide, if you decide that you're not like a die-hard hand tool user, it, it may be cheaper in the long run to just get your saws sharpened uh, at a sharpening service rather than trying to do it yourself. But let's see how this one cuts, despite it being slightly dull. All right, so we're just going to do a real quick test with one of these cut-off pieces here. Start the saw. super dull. Uh, if I had used one of my, my saws that's all sharp, uh, that would have taken me about half the time. In fact, as comparison, let's try that out. All right, so here's a good crosscut saw. Uh, same number of teeth, just uh, has a sharp, sharpened teeth instead of dull. Yeah, you can see the difference a sharp saw makes versus a dull one. All right, so that is it. Uh, we have cleaned up this saw, refinished the handle, and now it is ready to be sharpened and put back into use. So now you can go out and find old saws at flea markets, eBay, um, you know, Craigslist, wherever, tag sales and fix up your own. If you, if you are planning on doing a lot of hand tool work, you're going to want um, a couple different varieties of hand saw, different tooth patterns, and definitely some rip cut and some cross cut 
teeth. We will do a sharpening video in the future, so please make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, give me a thumbs up. That'll be all for this video. We came, we saw it, we created some dust. Now it's your turn. Go out in your shop and make something. But that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We came, we saw it, we made some dust. Now it's your turn. Get out in your shop and make something, and I'll see you next time.